Whether you're programming with Lua scripts, the block controller, or simple control components, the end result is often to put some sort of button onto a UCI for the user to activate. Perhaps your button is going to launch your custom script, or maybe be controlled by a script. Whatever it is, you'll need to link those controls somehow to your programming. Well, this will often mean you need to add blank controls to your design, so let's look at how to do that in each of the three methods. As a reminder, there are only a few fundamental types of controls. Buttons and knobs are interactive, while meters and LEDs simply display information. Text fields could potentially be either. You could input information into a text field, or you could use it to display another control string. To add a blank button directly into your design, you could grab the custom controls component. By default, it has nothing in its control panel until you define which control you'd like here in the properties. You can add multiple copies of the same type of button in groups. So let's select a type for our first group. Here, it looks like there are about 20 different types of controls, but they're all variations of the same five we mentioned earlier. These are all different types of knobs, and these are all buttons, see? They just have different predetermined ranges and denominations, which you may also be able to customize. Once you've selected one type of control for one group, you can add more identical controls by increasing the count number, from 1 up to 256. You now also have an option to add a second group for a new type of control. Be aware that you can't select the same type of control for your second group. If you need more than 256 controls of the same type, you'll need to add another custom controls component. Thinking back to our earlier video on the QSIS control tree, the differences between these controls might make more sense now. A mute button and a toggle button, for instance, have the exact same values and positions, but a toggle button has strings of true and false, while a mute button has strings of muted and unmuted. If you added a generic float knob with the same range as a level knob, then they would have the exact same numerical value and positions, but the string of the level knob would include db at the end. Visit the help file for a full list of the values, positions, and strings of these controls, as well as their default and customizable ranges. If you're using control components, then you can start wiring these custom controls directly to whichever control pins you like. If you're using the control script components, then you can wire these to your script. You can then reference that control within the script by using the keyword controls, which is the main object of the control tree. In this case, controls.inputs or controls.outputs, depending on where it's wired. You'll also need to note which pin it's connected to in a bracket, which is known as its index. You could then extend this control tree to reference a specific property of the control. Using the print command we learned about in the previous video, I could print this control's value to the debug window with the command print controls.inputs index one dot value. However, if you're creating custom controls just to wire them to a control script, you might want to use the text controller component instead. This component allows you to add blank controls to your design, but those controls are already embedded in your script, which makes them easier to reference. A reminder that older versions of QSIS have the scriptable controls component instead of the text controller. Their functionality is mostly the same, but they have a slightly different interface. We'll focus on the text controller version. The interface for adding controls in this component is different than the custom controls component, but the concept is the same. Rather than defining the controls in the properties, we can add them directly here in the control panel. Start by clicking the plus button to add a control, and you can then specify what type of control it is by category. All buttons are grouped together, and then you can define if it's a momentary, toggle, or trigger button. If we select indicators, we'll find our LEDs, meters, and text displays. Personally, I find this organization a little more intuitive than the custom controls we just looked at, because that was arranged alphabetically, whereas these are grouped by function. 
For controls with a customizable range, you can specify the min and max values. And if you'd like to expose this control to be wired to something else within QSYS, you can choose to include an input or output pin, or both, which you'll notice are added to your components in the schematic. You also have the ability to name this control, which I highly recommend you do. Control 1 isn't a great name. You could name it after yourself, Kevin. What? How did I know your name was Kevin? I'm just that good. All the Kevins out there right now are freaking out and everyone else is like, my name's not Kevin. Anyways, the benefit of naming your control is that you can address that control by its name within the script. Rather than controls.inputs index1, which we saw in the previous example, I can now reference this control with controls.kevin in the script. If you add multiple counts to the same control, you'll have to reference that index in the Lua control tree like this controls.kevin index1, much like the inputs of the control script. Be careful about using spaces in the names of your controls. If your control name includes a space, you'll need to reference it in brackets and quotes like this. Controls, bracket, quote, Kevin Jones, quote, bracket. P.S. If there is a Kevin Jones watching this, he just lost his mind. Also, do yourself a favor and use a consistent naming convention so that if another programmer needs to work on this design someday, they can easily understand your labels. Finally, let's look at the block controller. Double click this control panel and you'll see the same interface that we saw in the text controller. You can add buttons, define their type, etc. Once again, you have the option to add control pins to the components and give your control a name. This time, if you include a space in the name of a control, don't worry about it. The block controller knows how to compensate for that possible syntax error by building in the brackets and quotes appropriately when it compiles. So go crazy, Kevin. Name him whatever you want. This guy is obsessed with Kevins. Hey, Kevin, what you watching? Get out of my cube, Kevin. Okay, sorry. One big benefit to the block controller is that you can also add connections in this same style. Similar to the command buttons, you can specify if this is a TCP, UDP, or serial connection and provide a name. The IP address and port number can be adjusted once you're in emulation or run mode, or if you want to control these dynamically, you can expose control pins for them. Inside the block controller, you'll see these connections listed beneath your controls with new blocks associated with all the possible actions you might perform over a connection like this. We'll look at these connections in a later video. That's it for adding controls. There's a quick exercise in your control worksheet to complete now, and once you're done, move on to the next section in which we'll look at some of the other control tree branches associated with these controls.